we're not so concerned with the outer man. The outer man is going to perish. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what hair do you have. It doesn't, all that stuff doesn't matter at all. What does matter is what's the inner man uh, partaking of and what's the inner man associating with. And, and so we've been talking and dealing with the inner man, but walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, and also uh, operating in the spirit. There's a difference between living somewhere and operating in the same place. You can live in a house and you can sit on the couch or a kitchen table all day and that's all you're doing. You're living in the house. But if you're doing renovations or you're working, then, then you begin to operate in that same house. So it's not just about walking and living in the spirit. We also have to operate in the spirit. That's all part of our inner man. And so uh, doing that, and again, we, we talked about, uh, or we just sang the song about, I want more of Jesus, more and more and more. And uh, if I want more of Jesus, I'll give him more of me so so if, if i want to grow spiritually then i've got to take my old man and deny the old man put off the old carnal man and i've got to put on the new everybody say the new the new, the new spiritual man even though some of us have been in church for many many years and has have great experiences and different things in god we're still considered the new man mm -hmm. amen and so we've been looking closely also at the results of our lifestyle and the manifestations or the fruit of choosing um, uh, the, of the inner man, which, which direction the inner man takes. And, and it was never the intention of God. And, and this is one thing that people don't realize, that, that they, they think that, uh, you know, we're, we're okay and then we get converted, but we're not okay. It was never the intention uh, of God to create man to fulfill the lust of the flesh. God never designed you and I or, or called you and I or expected you and I uh, to, to, uh, to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And, and it was never the desire of God to, uh, for us to live and operate according to our flesh. That was not the design of God. That's not how he created us. And it, it, when God created us, he created us in his own image. And when you look at the image of God, that he doesn't do things in fleshly nature. No, he does not. He doesn't operate in the carnal nature. Even the time when Jesus was, uh, was here and he, and he flipped the tables in anger at the temple and, and people get up in arms about how God showed, or Jesus showed anger and all that, he was still operating in his spirit. That was, that's a spiritual thing that he was taking care of, not, not a fleshly thing. He was taking care of carnality. And so it's never his desire for you and I to live and operate according to our own desires. When God created man, he created us in his image to be like him. And we say to be like him. To be like him. See, that's the inner man. He, he, he created us in his image. And when he created us in his image, then he created us with the thought or the desire or the goal that we live like him. And, and it was and it is his desire, and it's also his design uh, of the Holy Ghost for us to live according to the spiritual man. And, and that's how we were first created, and that's why we need that born-again experience. You see, if, if it wasn't a necessity of being born again, we could live a good life. And, and that, that may have been enough, but, but it's not enough for the inner man. And so the, the world thinks I can give and I can do this good and I can do that good. But if we're not born again, we're not reverting back or converting back or transforming back to that spiritual man that we were designed in. Amen. Amen. So the Lord wants us and it's his design that we revert back to living and walking after the spirit. Having the results of our lives uh, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Not, not that gray area. You know, there's always gray areas in our life. And I, I don't believe the Lord wants us to live in a gray area. I, I think that when, if we find ourselves in a questionable position, where, where it's, you could go this way or that way, it might be right, it might be wrong, and if I twist this around and make it look right or sound right, then I'm okay. We do not and should not be able to want to live in that position. We've got to make our yeas yea and our nays nay. We've got to be on a shadow of a doubt Amen. Follow the desire of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is always 
looking for somebody to live for him. Amen. When, when you go back into history and you read uh, through the Old Testament and New Testament, the Lord's always looking for somebody to live right, somebody to search after him, somebody to long for him, somebody to serve him, somebody, amen, to, to be like him. David said to his son Solomon, he said, and thou Solomon, my son, he said, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of thee. But if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. So he, he was telling him here that, you know, the, the Lord uh, is searching. And, and, and the next sentence, he said that uh, the Lord understands all the imaginations of the heart. And, and so when we read this, we can't use the excuse. Well, the Lord understands my imagination. He might understand your imagination. He might understand your carnal nature. He may understand the, your fallen nature. He may understand why you fell, how you fell. And he might understand the situation that fallen state you're in. Doesn't mean he wants you to be there. That's right. I understand when, when a kid gets on my bus and he trips over a, a, a rock or something. I understand he's tripping over a rock, but I also could tell him, pick up your feet. I understand why you trip, but there's, there's no reason for you to trip if you see where you're walking, whatever the example would be. And so the Lord is seeing us. I understand where you're at, but you don't need to be there. I understand what you're going through. I understand the temptation. Remember, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he's without sin. So God is searching and looking for those, those people who choose to choose him looking for those who are willing to live the way that he wants us to live. To the church in Ephesus, Paul wrote, and we're going to look at this tonight, uh, concerning what he felt was God's calling on his life. And, and you may wonder why we're we looking at Paul's calling, because it's not my calling and not your calling, that if we understand what his calling is and apply his calling to our life, we will be empowered. Now, when, when he began to write about his calling, uh, he also mentioned that uh, what he was doing caused some effects and some tribulation, some hardship. It caused some turmoil. It caused some travail. It caused trials and, and, and a lot of suffering. We, we read some of them when, when he began to talk about labors and stripes and prisons and, and near death and, and, and beatings and stonings and left for the dead. This is important because we read over those things. And we say, wow. Poor Paul, look what he suffered. But that, that's his background for this. This is, this is a foundation for what he's going to say in a little bit. Left for the dead, perils and, and tired pain, hunger and care. And these are just some of the things he wrote to the Corinthian church that he personally had to deal with. And, and so he's writing these things to the churches and understand where Paul was. All Paul was trying to do was minister to the people. You would think that, that in the hum, human mind or the carnal thinking that if I do a good deed for God, he is going to bless me beyond measure. And the deeper the deed is, the greater the blessing. Now, when you look at the life of Paul and, and, and the things that he did and what, uh, you know, where he went, what he preached and how he preached and his, his, his spiritual walk and, and all those things, you would expect the blessings come down from heaven in barrelfuls. But he's not writing about blessings. I did all this, and then I get beat. I did this, and I get shipwrecked. I did this, and, and I'm wondering where God is because I'm about to be thrown off a wall. So we see the, the depth of, of his relationship and his, his calling and his walk, the, how deep it was with God that, that even though the blessings did not come, See, the blessings may not come every time you, you, you uh, uh, do a good deed to somebody in this world. That's right. The rivers of, uh, are not, may not flow, uh, you know, of the divine miracles coming into your home because you gave a dollar to missions mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. You, you may have some side effects that are not exactly positive. And I'm not trying to preach something uh, uh, negative here or teach something negative. I'm just trying to be real. Paul did not experience. 
You see, when he was in the spirit doing the things of God, God blessed him. But when he stepped out of the spirit, the carnal took over. The humanity of people took over and he suffered very much for it. But when he was writing to the Ephesians, he, he wrote to them and he said, uh, for this cause, he said, I, Paul, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He didn't come and say, I'm an ambassador. I'm the pastor. I'm the apostle. I, I, I'm the teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm the blessing. He said, I'm a prisoner. Now, when I think of somebody who's in prison, they're locked up. I, when I think of a, 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 somebody who's a prisoner, I think they have no say in what they're about to do. Now, we, we know that Paul was not imprisoned by the Spirit, yet in his mind, he was. I can't get away from this. He said, and this is what he was telling the church in Ephesus, he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, but there's a purpose. So he said, I'm a prisoner for you. And we're going to look into this tonight, next week. He, he, he said, I'm a prisoner. I'm locked in. I'm jailed. I, I, I'm handcuffed to you. I can't get away. It's all for you. It's not my blessing. It's not, it's not for me to get rewarded. I'm going to receive nothing. I'm not going to get a paycheck for this. I, I am not going to get a dinner for this. And nobody's going to come along and put me on a 747, send me to a, a resort somewhere in, in the Bahamas in the middle of winter and have a holiday. He said, I'm, I'm a prisoner for you. And God had shown him what he wanted the early church to receive from Paul. But not only the early church, I feel and I think and I know that we've got to get back to what Ephesus was about to receive. And we need to receive the same thing they received. And it's called a revelation. No matter the consequences, this is, this is what Paul was saying. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a prisoner. It doesn't matter what the consequences are going to be. It doesn't matter what the hurt was or is or will be. It doesn't matter what I have to sacrifice. I am a prisoner. The revelation of God to the inner man. Amen. It was and it is of the utmost importance to our life. It's too long the church has gone along sailing on a free ride, expecting everybody and everything to work around our personal, I don't mean a physical schedule, our personal schedule. The fact that the Gentiles, the Bible says we're to be uh, fellow heirs and partakers of the promise, uh, amen. And, and to Paul, he said, you're receiving the promise is more important than my comfort. Again, he's not getting anything out of this deal. He's a prisoner. He's sent to the church. He, he's sent to write the, to the church. He's sent to minister. He's sent to you and I to write to minister to us. He gets nothing out of it in this world. In verse uh, chapter 3 and verse 8, he said unto me, he said unto me, whom am I less than the least of all the saints. In this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He, he was telling them, you know, as a prisoner I, I, of all the saints, I, I, am, I am not on the upper rung. I am lower than low. That's how he saw it. But he said that I should preach. And I'm coming to you and I'm writing to you Amen. To, the, the, to preach, uh, amen, that we are to receive the unsearchable riches of God, the untrackable, the unsearchable, the unmeasurable riches or abundance, uh, amen, or value. See, we come, we receive the blessing, and we go. Emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. We come, we receive, we go. This is not what he's talking about. He said, I've come to preach to you the unsearchable, the un 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 untrackable, unmeasurable abundance that God has for the church. What a description that he wants us 
not just to know about. We know about the riches of God. We know about the blessings of God. We know about the dynamic and powerful healings of God. We know all about them. But he doesn't want you just to know about them. He wants you to, to understand them, not with the outer man, but with the inner man. And you would take what your knowledge knows and settle it in your heart, in the inner man, into the inner, inner, inner being of our lives. The unsearchable riches of God. You see, the world, they flaunt, to, I mean, they flaunt what they call their riches. And, and they flaunt it with pomp and pageantry. They, they flaunt it with brilliant lights. It, it appeases the flesh. It, it, it entertains the natural. It, it, it brings joy to the carnal. That's what they do. And people turn it all to those things. But in the end, as Solomon said, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. In other words, it's time limited. It, it, it's, it, it perishes. It comes to an end. Anything that's not of Jesus must come down. Okay? So if the world flaunts its temporary things, should not the church begin to flaunt the spiritual things? And I don't mean go onto the sidewalk and the highways and byways. I'm talking about within ourselves. Should we not flaunt that within ourselves and be reminded, not the knowledge, oh, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. We know that. We can, we can talk about that. But to get it from here and put it in here, that we start living the life that we believe is there. You see what I'm talking about? I, I'm trying to pull this out of our head and put it in our heart. That we're not just talking about it and preaching about it and singing about it. We're living it. And we're experiencing it to the inner man. We, we, in, instead of the temporary, we're to seek the, 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 the uh, deeper things of God, the more valuable things, uh, the things that are going to stand the test of time. And to Paul, all the suffering in the world, Everything that he suffered, everything he put up with, everything that he felt in his body, everything that, that, that all that was worth trying to get this new church. And can I say the old church now? Trying to get the people to see something different and worth more than the world has to offer. That's right. I'll give you an example. A lot of people, and I'm not saying here, but, but if, if there's a carnival in town or a, uh, some, some big thing going on in town, instead of coming to church, we'll, we'll call and say, you know, I can't make it today because I've got to go to this. Or I've got to go to that. And, and, and so what we're doing is we're putting this and that ahead of the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is our value within ourselves. We leave the, out, the, uh, the inner man, we set it aside so we can enjoy the carnal nature. And so Paul said, uh, all this suffering is, is worth it if I can get somebody, not just to believe this, uh, but somebody to believe it to the point they start living it. Every shipwreck, every beating, Every rock that hit his head, every time he received a stripe, and every time he, he received something negative, it was worth it if I can get the church to understand who they are. And verse 9, he says, to make all men, this is my goal, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. You see, the fellowship of the mystery, the, the mystery is something that's hidden away. It's something that's not exposed. And it's something that, that, that you can't readily get to. But let me share something with you that you already know. We know how to get to the mystery. See, this is why the, the world can't find it. They don't see it. They don't understand it. But we in the church, we, we understand there's this mystery, but the mystery's opened up. It's all in Jesus. That's right, yeah. There's a song we sing, it's all in him. It's all in him. 
Everything about it, everything is about Jesus. Everything surrounds Jesus. He is not just the wheel. He is a hub in the middle of the wheel. He is everything to us, or he ought to be everything to us. Amen. He, he, he knows everything going on from the ending to the beginning. Everything before you have a prayer coming out of your mouth, he knows you've got a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. So, so everything is, is in this mystery, but we know here the mystery. People search daily, amen, for more. They, they search far and they search wide. They, 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 they spend money and time looking for an answer. They find it in their drugs. They find it in their alcohol. They find it in their relationship. They find, they're searching for it. They don't find it. They're looking for it. Yes. And Paul said, this mystery is found in Christ. To Timothy, he said without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the unknown, this mystery of devotion. God, everybody say God. God. Manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into the word. Here's the mystery, folks. That's why we, we pray in Jesus' name. That's why we sing in Jesus' name. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name. That's why we, we, we deliver people in the name of Jesus. That's why we do all things, amen, in word and deed. It's all in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he is the answer to the mystery. It's found in the revelation of Jesus Christ, God manifesting himself in flesh and and justified or confirming in the spirit, watched in action by the angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world and resurrected after his own death. The mystery is found in the confines of, of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is easy. We understand that because that's why you got baptized in his name. That's why you sought the Holy Ghost and God filled you with the Spirit. But this is not the end. This is the very beginning. This is is where the power of God begins to move. It's not where it ends. It's not in the middle. It's the very beginning. Amen. And there's no other access. You have a key. It's so important that Paul and the others were willing to suffer to expose, uh, amen, uh, so powerful, willing to to sacrifice, to to reveal, willing to uh, 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 leave everything to promote. Understand what they went through. Understand that, you know, we talk about our our forefathers and and when they came over from Europe and and all the sacrifice they made and, and, uh, you know, plowing with horses and cows and and suffering without homes and going across the nation and especially in the States uh, with horse and wagon and and, and family, leaving their family, all the sacrifice. But look at the sacrifice of the apostles. You see, those men and women of old, our forefathers, did not sacrifice that for for Joe Blow down the road. They sacrificed it for their own families. They went for a better life, a different life. But Paul and Silas and John and and Timothy and the other apostles and disciples, they weren't concerned with themselves. They were preaching for you. They were out there uh, being exposed to these spiritual elements uh, because they said, I want, we want to promote something. Uh, we want you to get hold of this. And it's time the church, the modern day church, received this revelation. I'm not talking about the revelation of the oneness or of Jesus. I'm not talking. We're going to go deeper. And we're not talking about just entertaining the inner man, but feeding the inner man and and nourishing the inner man and taking care of the inner man because your flesh, believe it or not, one day is going to perish. Amen. But your inner man is going to go into eternity. So instead of feeding the flesh with worldliness, we need to focus on the spiritual. Feeding with revelation, feeding with understanding, feeding with eternal, uh, unsearchable, amen, riches of Christ. And the answer begins, amen, with the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it does not end there. There's a new world that I want to expose beginning tonight. There's a new world of understanding available 
to those and only those who are willing. I'm going to tell you what I'm afraid of physically. I'm very claustrophobic. I get those EBGBs. You know what they are? Yeah, yeah. Anybody know what EBGB is? Yeah. They don't feel good, squeamish. Yeah. When I watch somebody go in a cave, somebody's cave cave search, they, they, they crawl through a hole about this big and they squeeze in. They don't know what's in there. I can't do that. I'm not willing to do that. So I will never experience what they experience. And I don't care. <laughs> you can take my part and you can parcel it up and you can keep it. I don't want it. But you see, with the riches of God, this revelation of Jesus Christ, not, and again, not who he is. That's where it begins. But to go deeper, we have got to be willing to take the step. And it's not easy. To the church in the cross, Paul wrote of this mystery. He said this in verse chapter 1, verse 25. He said, I'm made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Again, for them. Mm -hmm. Not for himself, for them. To fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom the God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. The first part of the mystery is God manifests in the flesh. The second part of this mystery, and this is where it begins, amen, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And again, this is stuff we know, but we often don't apply. There's a difference. It's no small revelation. It's no insignificant revelation or enlightenment. Now, I want you to think about this. Almighty God, who is unseen in spirit, rolled himself in flesh and dwelt among us for the sole purpose of redeeming you. That's right. He didn't do it for his glory, his honor, his majesty. He did it for you. He did it for me. And the second thing is, Almighty God, desire, let me say desire. 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 desire to find his home in you. Amen. Now you need to think about this. Almighty God robed in himself in flesh to die for you. But also his desire is not just to die for you, but he's desiring to live in you and through you. So when you stop, amen, and think, I'm a nobody, and you sit in your seat at home, and you're going through a hard time, and you're, you're in the, you know, where you're rubbing your belly on the carpet, and because you can't get yourself uh, up off the carpet, and you think, I'm insignificant, and I'm useless, and nobody wants me. Almighty God died for you and wants desires. He's not forced to. He wants to and chooses to live inside of each one of us. Now, we've got to have some time in our life, in our spiritual walk with God, we've got to take some time for what they call a Selah moment and stop and consider what this means to me. It's so powerful. We know it here. Don't we? We, we? we know, oh, I've got the Holy Ghost, and you know, I speak in tongues, and, and, but, but we've got to get it out of here and put it in here and understand that Almighty God wants to be in me. He manifests Himself in flesh to call you, to redeem you, the hope of glory, choosing to live within us in spite of who you are, in spite of what you did, right. in spite of what, what things you partook of, ignoring the qualified, amen, and choosing you. 
See, there's people more qualified than I am to stand behind this pulpit. There's people more qualified to sit in a pew than you and I put together. But God chose you because you allowed revelation in your mind and you answered that revelation. You see, there came a day in your life when you put your foot forward and you stepped in the right direction. Amen. And God met you where you're at and he gave you everything you have received. That is the mercy of God. That is the revelation of God. So Paul was saying uh, his ministry, his calling was to make all, all men, amen, all, all Gentiles, all people know the, the, the uh, fellowship of the mystery. We've got to understand it. In verse 10, he said, I don't want you just to, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he said, I don't want you just to understand this. I, I want to push you. And I'm going to tell you how far I'm going to push you to the intent. Let me say the intent. Yes. This is my intention. This is my goal. This is my desire. He said to the intent to, that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. I want to share with you, church, something. This is what Paul was saying. I want to share something with you, this revelation to the point to where you begin to understand that there's powers in heavenly places and principalities in heavenly places. I want you not just to know about them, but I want you to get them out of here and out of reading and put them in here in your inner man because they're so important. This is the intention, my intention. This is what Paul said. This is what's worthy of me getting beaten. This is what's worthy of me getting stoned. This is what's worthy of me being thrown off a wall. Because I want you to understand that there's worlds and principalities and powers in heavenly places you need to experience. His role, his responsibility, his calling, his ministry is to take the hearer beyond the revelation of Jesus as God because we knew he was writing to the church. They had received the revelation. They had repented and been baptized, received the Holy Ghost, and now he wants to take them deeper, past the revelation of their salvation to the point that principalities and powers that God has placed in heavenly places will be known and experienced. Amen by the church. See, I can come up here and I can teach you about heavenly things. I think. I, I, can, I, I can prepare message after message and lesson after lesson on the great things God has for you. But if I tell you about them and you leave them at the table, I have not wasted my time, but you have. See, this is Paul's intent for the church. Now remember, we looked at Peter's writing, and then keep going back to this, but 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, whereby were given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Those, that's a dynamic statement, but it's really empty. I can promise you the world, but if you don't know what the promise is, what have I done? You see, it's not just about a common salvation. It's not about being in a common church. It's not about a common experience. There's revelation that goes beyond the common. And I'm going to tell you something. It's time the church stopped thinking small. That's right, amen. It's time for the church to stop thinking insignificant. Remember the scripture says he is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. Wonderful scripture, but it's not the whole scripture. It's according to the power, we said the power, power that works within you. What you have allowed 
to operate in your spirit, what you have allowed to operate in your inner man. That's what he's going to do according to that. Above that, but if you can't pray, you can't dream, you can't think significant, what kind of answer is going to come? I'm not saying that, you know, aim for the cloud, or the moon, you're going to rest in the clouds, whatever that statement is. I, I'm not saying power of positive thinking. I am talking about revelation of Jesus Christ in you, allowing God to move in your life, in your inner man, not up here, not the carnal thinking. Oh, I wish upon a star that God will bless me. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about the inner man getting to the point where you start living. Mm -hmm. Not just talking, but living. Talk is cheap. I mean, you can look, you can talk, you can, you can act apostolic, and you can act Christian, but if you're not living it, you're not. God has something greater, amen, for his people, and we've got to grasp Amen. Something greater. We need to allow our spiritual eyes to be open. We need to seek the deeper things of God. We need to allow our minds, our spiritual minds, to focus on the unsearchable. We need to allow our inner man to attain the place the world cannot attain. That's right. If I'm praying for a new car, anybody in the world can buy a new car. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people can. I want to go deeper. See, not everybody in the world can attain great heights in spiritual, but I can. That's right. Not everybody can, can feel the power of God moving, vibrating through their, their being and, 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 and treating them like something special because they can't, because they haven't accessed the entrance of God. Yeah. But you can. I, I'm going to go back to that scripture. Draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh to you. You do the first step. You take the first Pete Paul was saying this. Said, Here, church, I want to show you something. I'm a prisoner. I'm, I'm in prison for you. I, I suffer so much because I want you to see this, uh, that God's not just going to pour out things on you. Uh, I and mean, you've got to search for more. It's reading something, and I'm going to take it way out of context. And I want you to, I want to take the principle out of this story that this, this young lady was scantily dressed and, and uh, somebody came up to her and said, listen, he, he said, you know, when, when God created the earth, uh, he put the, the special things under the ground. He said that the gold and the silver, and, and so people had to dig it out. It wasn't exposed. You're something special. You need to cover up. Because if, if God put gold on top, any old miner can go and grab the gold and use it for what he wants. What I'm saying, I'm not trying to use the girl for an example. What I'm trying to tell you is that things that are important are worth digging for. They're worth searching for. God doesn't lay them on the top for the world to find. They're for the church and the hungry and the thirsty and the longing and the desiring. There's no limitation. To do this. Remember what I said at the very beginning and I just mentioned it? To do this, we have to take the step. And the, and the step is this. Leave your flesh behind. See, the more flesh you can leave behind, the greater depth you can go. Remember the scripture says that the spirit wars against the flesh. So if, if I, my flesh is warring, it's still there. But if I can put it behind me and keep my eyes on the spiritual and on the things of God and the desires of God, and the more, more I leave behind, the deeper I go with him. We need to leave the ways of the world behind and leave them on a shelf. And we need to pick up not just the base revelation of Jesus Christ and not just our salvation, 
but pick up the revelation of the principalities and powers that God has available for the church. And this is what Paul was saying. This is my intent. This is where I want to get. This is my goal. It's my desire. Not for me. I get nothing out of this. I'm a prisoner. But you. Yeah. Now, think about this. Paul wrote of this not for his friends. He wasn't writing just for the local church. But for every member and every saint of God to read his word till eternity comes. So it wasn't just his friends he was sharing this secret with or this revelation with. It's for everybody to read. The Lord desires, the Lord wants, not just Paul. Remember, Paul is just writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost here. But the Lord wants his people to know, to understand, to experience the principalities, <coughs> excuse me, and powers that God has available. Now watch, watch this. The word principality, it means the first, the magistrate, and the chief. So this is the principalities that are in, in Christ. This is the, the first, the magistrate, the chief. Okay, this is what's available to us. We're not talking about a blessing of healing. We're not talking about, you know, showers of blessing or, or, or a, a miracle here and there. We're talking about principalities called the first, the, the magic. So what are we talking about? This deeper revelation of Jesus. The word powers, it means force or potent or authority. When we begin to leave our flesh behind and do what Paul is saying, and we begin to draw nearer, amen, closer to God and closer into this relationship and deeper in this revelation, we're not going to learn about how trees grow. We're not going to learn how, how gas is made or how God put electricity in the air and how static electricity works. No, we're going to learn more about him. That's what he's saying, that, that we're going to have the, the principality, the, the magistrate, the first, the chief. We're going to learn more of him. God's going to show more of himself to you. Now, remember, we don't need this in our mind. We don't need this on the outside. We don't need this in the carnal side of us. We need it on the inner man, the inside, the spiritual man. Because when I have this in me, I become more powerful. When I learn, uh, I get revelation of all this, uh, amen, I begin to understand that I've got the potent, uh, I've got the authority, I've got the magistrate at my disposal. I don't know what you're sensing right now, but there's something vibrating in me right now about all this. It, it's not just a revelation. Oh, isn't that nice? We learn more about him. When we read on its own, we, we think the blessings and anointing and fireworks, but it goes much deeper. The Lord wants his people to understand beyond simple revelation of who Jesus is and go beyond revelation of our salvation into this, can I call it, enhanced revelation. You see, we know, we, we know God is the potent. We know he's the authority. We understand he's the ultimate. We know that here. But we've got to know it here in deeper revelation. We've got to understand it with revelation. Hey, Amen. Not, not, not just somebody higher. We, we, we begin to live the life that, hey, the God that I serve. He, I'm not just going to sing, he's, he's a great God. Oh, yes, he is. I'm going to start living. He is a great God. Oh, yes, he is. And we understand there's nothing and, and no one higher, no more powerful, greater than him. First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul wrote, he said, he has put all things under his feet. To, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. When the word says that he has put all things under his feet, he does not mean most things. He does not mean some things. It literally, literally means all things. And now, if we could, now, if we could, let's say if I could, if I could. or I would, amen, allow this knowledge and this revelation to enter the inner man. If we could, or we would allow 
the inner man to focus and to be affected by this revelation. If we could or we would allow our inner man the access, uh, amen, uh, to this revelation to take precedence in our life. This is the eternal purpose. Remember what happened to Adam and Eve when they walked in the cool of the evening? Who walked with them? Right, until man fell. And that stopped. Now, what do you think was going through the mind of Adam? Talking to the Lord, learning about the Lord. He had no negative. He had no carnal nature. You don't know. No, I shouldn't say no carnal nature, but, but he, he was not affected by the world yet. So all the revelation, all the input was walking in the cool of the evening with God. Woo! Now, we say we wish we were there, but, but you know what? We have this thing called the Word of God. Yes. We've got revelation right here, folks. We've got revelation of the Spirit, of the Holy Ghost, to, to share with us if we'd allow it. That's right, amen. This is the eternal purpose. This is, this is why we're here. This is why we exist. Somebody said the other day, why, why are we here? Why, do, why, why are we here? Why, why do we exist? This is why. To fill our inner man with the knowledge and the learning and, and, and the equipping of the Spirit of God in my inner man that I can serve Him in greater dimension, that I can live for Him in greater measure, that I can put my trust in Him more and more and more. This is the design. We're talking about, the, the, you know, design, revival by design. This is a design. We're going to get to this next week. But, but if we can uh, get this template that we're called to be and answer that template, if, if we can grasp this, you know what happens to the church when we begin to grasp this? We grow. We grow but more important than us growing is we become unstoppable. and we can embrace this, we become the true church. Let me share something with you in closing. Hey Amen. this revelation, like electricity, is available. Yeah. If you tap into it. Yeah, you better plug it in. But I'm in the church, doesn't mean you're tapping into it. That's right. I know Jesus doesn't mean you're tapping into him. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all. Those are great scriptures. Those are great promises. Those are great quotes. But unless we tap into them, they're dormant. And can I, can I be so bold as to say useless? Yeah. Ephesians 3 and 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. There's a tremendous, exciting, great, supernatural, out of this world revelation. If we want to receive it, it is available. But if I don't tap into it, I'm saved. I'm quote unquote living for God. I'm going through the motions. I'm coming to church. But I'm not living. I'm not living the revival. I'm not living the design that God is wanting me to live. 